All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Mary Collier. I'm the Professional Development Program Manager at the Ontario Museum Association. And we are back by popular demand with another Ask Me Anything, this time with Susan Maltby. Um, and this is presented in partnership with the Group of Ontario Emerging Museum Professionals Committee. Before we get started, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that Toronto, where the OMA offices are located, has been the site of human activity for over 15,000 years. The land is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, Haudenosaunee, and Huron Wendat. And today, Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. And I'd also like to acknowledge that I am actually joining from Hamilton, which is a traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Mississauga nations and protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. So I hope everybody is doing well from wherever you are joining today. Um, thank you for being here this morning and I hope you're ready for a great conversation. So today's webinar will be one hour. Um, we'll begin with a bit of an introduction, then I'll pass it over to our presenters. Um, then at the end, I'll make some quick announcements and we'll wrap up at 11 a.m. So I'd like to start by introducing today's moderator, Madeline Smallers. She's the chair of the Group of Ontario Emerging Museum Professionals Committee and a museum professional with a strong interest in the experiences of diverse populations in cultural spaces, particularly through the accessible and inclusive management of programs, human resources, communications and operations. And of course, our speaker today is Susan Maltby, who is a conservator specializing in artifact con conservation, has been in the field for over 30 years. And uh, you'll hear plenty more about Susan's background throughout the rest of the webinar. So why don't we get started? I'll pass it over to Madeline to get going. Thank you very much, Mary, and to the Ontario Museum Association. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Madeline Smollers, as Mary said. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a mad queer disabled museum professional uh, living and working in the city of Kingston, Ontario, Canada. I'm also chair of the Group of Ontario Emerging Museum Professionals Committee, and you'll see that um, the OMA has kindly put up a slide um, showing you all some ways to get in touch with us. I monitor that email all the time, so please feel more than welcome to drop us a line if you have any questions, comments, or concerns uh, during or after this program. I will also pop our URL for our website in the chat in just a little bit. On behalf of the GoEMP committee, um, I would like to read our land acknowledgement statement. All right. The GoEMP committee acknowledges that in what is today known as the province of Ontario, we are guests who live, work, and meet on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Attawandaran, Haudenosaunee, Iyaniwak, Kayanakahaga, Metis, Ottawa, Ojibwe, Onondaga, Oneida, Potawatomi, and Wendat peoples. Some territories remain unceded, unceded, while others are covered by treaties, and we strongly encourage our community members to learn the treaties in their regions of Turtle Island. We express deep gratitude that we are able to carry out our work as a committee on these territories, and we are thankful for the land and the resources we are using in our work. We honor all of the diverse Indigenous peoples who have called these territories home since time immemorial. I wanted to give a little bit of a background as to why we are all here today. Um, as Mary said, back by popular demand, this is actually the third edition of Ask a Museum Professional Anything. And in part, it is thanks to all of you who have shown interest in this series, um, but it's also because back at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic last year in the spring, uh, the GoEMP committee realized that things were changing extremely rapidly for EMPs in our province and we wanted to get a grasp of what was going on and how we could meet people's needs where they were at. So we did do a COVID-19 survey and we had over 100 respondents which was fantastic. If some of you are in the audience, thank you so much because that data has proved invaluable. From that data, we were able to um, determine that we definitely needed to offer some more professional development programs, and that is one of the reasons why um, this AMA series is happening today. 
The first one took place in July uh, with Sarah Bean Borg, the second in September with Irene Schaumers, and then now this year, the first one of this year, and perhaps not the last, I don't know uh, if someone will come out of the woodwork to say that they want to participate for number four, please feel free to let me know. Um, but this is the first happening this year and the third uh, edition of this series overall. The Ontario Museum Association has been an incredible partner for the GoEMP committee um, for a long time, uh, but we're especially thankful for their supportive series because um, they offer you know, so much help and a great way for us to connect with you all and to connect you all to wonderful people such as Susan Maltby, uh, who I'm very grateful for, uh, for reaching out to me and uh, saying that she wanted to participate and for being here today, making herself available. All right. All right. Great. Thanks. Well, good morning to all. And um, uh, I'll just get started then. Um, okay. So how did I get into conservation? Uh, when I was in my last year of high school, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I liked the sciences, I liked history, I liked archaeology. And uh, what I ended up doing was talking to a guidance counselor at the University of Toronto. And he said, you know, um, there's this Masters of Art Conservation program at Queen's University that really seems to fit your interest. And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. And I tucked it away in the back of my head and went on with things. And my first year at uh, U of T, I enrolled in the sciences, taking Anthro 100 and Greek and Roman history as my electives. The summer after my first year, I did an archaeology field course in Israel. I realized then that what I really loved was archaeology, and I loved, um, being, I, I loved being in the field. So I decided I didn't want to be a chemist, a mathematician, or a biologist, so I switched to anthropology archaeology. I also realized that there were only a few ways that one could get into the field, i.e. doing field work. One route was to get a PhD, find a teaching job, get grants, and go in the field. The other was to be a specialist, whether it was a specialist in ceramics, lithics, geology, conservation. But hmm, there always seemed to be spots for specialists on excavations. So I decided I was going to become an archaeological conservator. In addition to working in Israel, I did two field seasons in Egypt. And this is a very old image of me at Karnak in Upper Egypt. Sadly, our site that I worked on was not half as interesting as this. I also did a survey season in Cyprus. Uh, so after I graduated, I did my master's in art conservation at Queens, specializing in artifacts. And when I graduated, there were no jobs. And sadly, things have not changed much since then. I was fortunate to be hired as an intern by the Canadian Conservation Institute in Ottawa for their mobile lab program. The mobile lab program brought preventive conservation to small community museums across Canada. We drove around the, in the mobile lab, which you see here. The van was kitted out as a mini conservation lab on wheels. Frankly, from my time out on the road, we never actually used it to do treatments. Anything we did, we did in the museum. We just used it to store stuff. Uh, prior to going out in the lab, we were given several days training in each of the labs at CCI. So we spent a few days in textiles, furniture, paper, archaeology, ethnology. The skills that I learned during that training, for example, making boxes and storage mounts for objects, are skills that I use to this day. As an intern, I traveled with a senior conservator for three weeks at a time. As an intern, uh, and we would fly into the airport closest to our first stop, pick up the van, and then we would work through the planned visits, spending on average two days in each, each of the museums. And then we'd leave the van at another airport, the next team to pick up when they flew in. Back in Ottawa, we would write up a report for each museum we visited, outlining our findings and recommendations, essentially a consultant's report. We did two trips uh, per summer. I really loved the mobile lab. It cemented my commitment to preventive conservation and I also learned how to do a lot with very little money, which has put me in good stead as museums often have little money for preservation. When we interns were not on the road, we were all assigned to a specific lab. I was in ethnology where I dealt with First Nations and Inuit material primarily, but I also treated a pair of severely degraded rubber bathing shoes, a NASA space suit, Egyptian cartonnage, and I co-developed and delivered a seminar opening and closing a seasonal museum. After two years, the mobile lab program ended and I was fortunate to be offered a two-year term position, filling in for a colleague who took leave to work in Hawaii. A term, as the name implies, is finite. In my case, two years. After that time, I would be out of a job. So my husband and I made a deal. The 
first one to get the first real job would be where we'd end up. He got the real job in Toronto, so that was where we ultimately settled. I considered it a real privilege to have spent almost four years at CCI. As it is a conservation research institute, I was able to work with some really interesting conservators and conservation scientists and take time to develop complex treatments that only rarely one has time to do elsewhere. Once my term was up, I did a short contract in Ottawa for the Ontario Heritage Foundation and then moved to Toronto and set up in private practice as there were no real jobs to be had. This is the first big project I worked on. Uh, this is the interior of the Church of the Holy Trinity in downtown Toronto. I worked as part of a team that dealt with the conservation and restoration of the original stencil decoration on the, the church's walls. It was a very challenging project in many ways. The one thing that I learned from it was that I really like big projects. I love the scale and I love the complexity. I also realized that I also like site work. Teaching and training are a big part of my practice. I have taught preventive conservation in the Museum Studies program at the University of Toronto for over 25 years. I teach in the University of Victoria's Cultural Resource Management program. I teach a distance class there. And I used to teach at a wonderful place, the Campbell Center for Historic Preservation Studies in the US, which is sadly no longer there. There I taught two short courses and team taught a third one. And in this picture, you can see me with my environmental, my museum environment class. And what we're doing is showing off our environmental monitoring equipment. Because the Campbell Center was in the US and I'm Canadian, I would drive to Buffalo every year and apply for a TN, and that stands for Trade NAFTA visa. That was specifically for my time at the Campbell Center, where I was providing training. I wasn't teaching. I was training because I do not have a teaching certificate. Both Irene and Sarah talked about the importance of ongoing education. And one of the best courses that I ever took was entitled Train the Trainers. And it was aimed at those of us who were already training other people. I took it while I was in Ottawa and it really changed how I approach teaching and training. I continue to take courses that interest me. Uh, the OMA, as my colleagues pointed out, has some great offerings. For over 30 years, I've been a columnist for Coin World, a US weekly numismatic publication. My column, originally entitled Saving Money, and every pun was intended, deals with preventive conservation of new for numismatic collections. My column is short, 650 to 700 words, which is not very many words when you are writing about complex topics such as corrosion or paper degradation to a non-technical audience. Annually, with the exception of this past year, I give a half day training seminar for the Royal Canadian Numismatic Association. And what you can see here is, my, is me, me with my class and what we're doing is taking the pH of everybody's hands. And what this does is demonstrates why conservators want you to wear gloves when you're handling metal objects because our hands are acidic. In her presentation, Sarah talked about how important it is to learn how to be a good communicator. I cannot agree enough. Communicating both verbally and in writing. As she said, if it doesn't come to you naturally, there's lots of help out there. Practice, practicing really does make a difference. Also come up with a strategy that works for you. I write a script for any conference that I give and I practice it with a kitchen timer to the point where I know it by heart, actually to the point where I can hardly stand it. Using a timer is a good way to keep your talk on time. As a conservator, my ultimate client is the object. I am its advocate. If I can't speak on behalf of my objects, I'm not doing my job. Over my career, I've fallen into things and never really been allowed to fall out of them. And working on buildings is one of those things. Buildings are just big objects in an uncontrolled environment. Early on, I worked on this building, Queens Park, or at Ledge, the Ledge as most of us call it. I worked on several phases of the stone conservation and did projects inside, including historic paint analysis. I worked across the street, inside and out at the Whitney Block and on numerous other buildings in Toronto and elsewhere. I've spent a fair amount of my life uh, up on scaffolding and on construction sites. This is the Library of Parliament in Ottawa. It underwent a full restoration starting in 2003. This is probably one of the most challenging project, building projects I've had to date. I was responsible for all the metalwork inside and out on the building and I can tell you there's a lot of it. The skilled trades did the conservation work, 
uh, were, but I was responsible for all the documentation. So that was a condition assessment for every piece. I wrote a treatment proposal and report for every component and I marked up the as-built drawings. Now here you can see a nice pretty after shot. Um, it never looked that nice when I was there because it was always a construction site. I do a lot of site work. More often than not, I go to the object rather than it coming to me. And this is probably one of the more extreme examples of that. A couple of years ago, I flew by helicopter, which you can see behind me on this slide, from Halifax to a tiny little island, Machaya Seal Island, off the coast of Maine. Uh, here we are refueling on Grand Manan on the way back. I was part of a team dealing with the preservation of this historic lighthouse. I worked with engineers and architects. I was responsible for carrying out a condition assessment of all the metalwork in the interior of the lantern. And the lantern is the bit at the top of the lighthouse. It's where the light is. I had two hours from touchdown to takeoff on the island to do my work. And that was the pilot's orders. He was concerned about the weather. And given that it was late January and the day before uh, the flight was canceled because of snow, I totally had no problem with that. Condition assessments are part of any conservator's job. This is a private collection of hockey memorabilia that was being donated to the Canadian Museum of History in Ottawa. It was being brought in under the Canadian Cultural Property Export Review Board, or CPERB, meaning that the donor got a tax receipt. A condition assessment is part of that process. Since the collector and his collection were in Toronto, I was hired by the museum to deal with the objects and a paper conservator with the paper-based objects. Um, it was a big, challenging job. There was a lot of stuff and much of it was pretty inaccessible. I write a lot of reports. The mobile lab experience actually really did pay off. I always tell my students that if you don't like writing term papers, don't become a consultant. A few years ago, I did the study for the Hart House at the University of Toronto, looking at the preservation of its extensive art collection that is housed inside and outside the building. Due to its public nature, it is a challenging collection to preserve. I also do a lot of projects that involve working with multidisciplinary teams. Who is on the team depends on the project. It could be architects, engineers, industrial designers, landscape architects, or exhibit designers, interpretive planners, or curators. It just depends on the project. I really love doing collaborative projects. I love the fact that we all look at things differently and there is just a wonderful sense of synergy. I often fill in-house gaps in teams such as we see here. I was hired by the ROM to help with the install of the Maya show as they did not have a stone or ceramics conservator on staff at the time. I worked closely with the courier, who's the lady on the left, and the ROM's collections manager, who you see on the right. And what we're doing here is examining the incoming objects for the show. I have assisted in a fair number of exhibit installs and deinstalls. And like Sarah, I've spent quite a bit of time on the floor and under things. A few years ago, uh, Science North hired me, out, hired me to help out with the show, The Science of Ripley's Believe It or Not. My job on the team was to act as a conservation advisor and to advise on collections and management issues. From both standpoints, the show was challenging given that it was going to be on the road for seven years with real objects and was going back and forth across the US-Canada border. The exhibit included problematic items such as sunken heads, two-headed calves, things that if proper clearance was not obtained well in advance could hold you up at the border for a very long time. Uh, here we see a sample of the exhibit designer's plans and my input is in the red boxes. So, I was basically there as an advocate for the stuff. This is a current uh, collaborative project that I'm working on. Our team is designing and implementing a curatorial center in Gatineau, Quebec, that will consolidate almost all of Parks Canada's collections, both historical and archeological from across Canada. I worked with the architect's interior designer and space planner to develop a storage plan for the facility that fitted their varied needs. The footprint of the building is quite small. So we had to go up 20 feet in order to maximize the use of space. And you should know that most of the shelving will be mobile. So here's a sample of one of the plans, the individual on the left, that's an average height person. So it gives you a sense of, the, of scale. So 20 feet tall mobile shelving is really quite a daunting thought. I work a lot with the skilled trades. This is my buddy Keith, who works for Henderson Machinery Moving Inc. 
Keith is a steel worker by trade. And he and his colleagues move a lot of large, delicate objects. In this case, it's the bowl to the Gore Park Fountain in Hamilton, but they also move delicate medical equipment amongst other things. Moving large objects safely is simply part of their trade. Having watched them work, I brought them in to help me move St. Michael, who you see here, at St. Michael's Hospital in downtown Toronto. Frankly, rigging is a transferable skill. Moving St. Michael was very challenging and they did a great job. Uh, they are my riggers of choice. Over the years, I've ended up moving quite a few things. And again, something I fell into. I work a lot with public art and artifacts. This is a steam flywheel in Oakville. Essentially, we paint to protect as it is in a completely uncontrolled environment. And here you can see after uh, treatment, looks pretty good. Uh, this project was phased over several years to spread out the costs. I spend my client's money like it's my own. Work included abatement of asbestos insulation and lead-based paint. Neither one of those is an inexpensive task. The colors you see here are accurate to what it would have looked like when it was running. The green came from a comparable flywheel at the Henry Ford Museum, and the red from a flywheel in Kitchener that went from the Kaufman factory directly to the museum. The black is in areas that were originally bright metal, and this piece is maintained on an annual basis. Preserving public art and artifacts is challenging due to their public nature and the fact that they are rarely given the same protection that other works get. Planning and budgeting for preservation is important. In this case, we are looking at a collection at Brock University. I've done several technical reviews of monument designs working closely with the artist. And this is one of the figures from the War of 1812 monument, which sits on Parliament Hill in Ottawa. Here we see the artist adjusting a detail so that the sculpture sheds water rather than retains it. This is Richard Sierra's Silk Tilted Spears at Pearson International Airport. I know many of you must know this sculpture. Not long after it opened in 2007, this graffiti appeared on the sculpture. In reality, it was due to the failure of an anti-corrosion coating. I was brought in to figure out what to do. I was tasked with getting rid of the failed coating, all four layers of it, while retaining the black underlayer. To put it mildly, this is an extremely difficult place to work. It is in a highly secure area. You are feet from boarding a plane. I was always escorted by either security or the curator, even when I went to the bathroom. And I was always watchful of my tools, which included sharp objects like scalpels. As the consultant, I defined the work to be done, which was carried out by a number of skilled trades. And here you can see afterwards. And everyone was very happy, which is great. Uh, if anyone is interested in knowing more details about this project, I gave a paper on this a couple of years ago and would be happy to share the preprint. If public art and artifacts are maintained regularly, they should, there should be no need for costly interventive treatments. Maintenance for things like this 15 foot high sculpture at Brock University is, just, is pretty simple. It's essentially a wash and a wax. It's like a car. If not maintained, you'll end up having to do an interventive treatment such as we see going on here. Although it looks good after treatment, regular maintenance is preferable. I do do interventive treatments. They're fun and they're challenging, but fundamentally I feel that our conservation dollars are better spent uh, preventing damage rather than responding to it. This is one of my latest projects. It is, it is a 33 and a half meter tall kinetic sculpture in Toronto. It sadly suffered from little to no maintenance. Some components were taken down recently as they are at risk of falling off. And it is important to remember that life safety trumps all. I'm on a team with an architect and an engineer. We are tasked with getting it back up and running in fairly short time frame. So because of the short time frame, I spent a Saturday morning a week before Christmas up in a bucket doing our condition assessment. And here you can see the engineer doing his assessment and for a sense of perspective, this is his picture looking back down. That person at the top of the image in the red coat is me. Okay, so it's a very, very long way up. And I don't like heights. Um, although I don't need it very often, my working at height certificate is something that I keep up to date because a lift is often the most effective way to do an assessment. I've done quite a bit of work over the years with historic cemeteries, and this is probably one of the more memorable and challenging cemeteries. It's an Irish Catholic cemetery, formerly on the grounds of Pearson Airport. It had to be completely moved, including the people buried there, so they could be put so they could put in a de-icing facility. For this project, I worked with a large archaeological firm. 
It was my job to get the monuments moved off to the side for repair so the archaeologists could excavate below and exhume the remains. The move and repairs were done by skilled masons. Uh, here we are in move day, going from the airport to a local cemetery where the remains were to be reburied and the monuments re-erected, if at all possible. The gentleman on the left was my move consultant, stone carver by trade and stone conservator. I essentially apprenticed with him. Most of what I know about stone, I learned from him, not in school. Now, here's a fun fact, folks. Did you know that you need to call air traffic control when you put up a crane at an airport? I didn't, and I do now, and man, did we get reamed out, rightfully so. Okay, finally, is private practice for you? Um, some of you may be thinking, there aren't a lot of jobs, do I go into private practice? I honestly didn't know if it would suit me until I did it. Turns out I love it. So if you're considering it, here's my list of things to think about. Can you go to work when there's no work? It's a lot of work finding work. It was really tough in the beginning and responding to things like requests for proposals, quotes, budget costing, part of our day, takes up a lot of time. If you get the project, it's great. If you don't, say la vie. Are you self-sufficient and self-motivated? This is pretty important. Be honest with yourself. Can you get the job done working by yourself or do you need a boss or supervisor to push you? Do you, get, do you expect to get paid regularly? Being self-employed is like being perpetually unemployed. Waiting to get paid the money you are owed is a constant experience for all of us. Overhead doesn't go away. Although my company pays me a salary, the only part of my overhead that I can get away without paying is my salary. Do you know who to call? I have a whole bunch of go-to guys and gals who I can call on if I need to bounce something off of them or get some guidance. Having a good network is important when you work by yourself. My company is Malpine Associates Inc. for a reason. I have a number of trusted associates who I work with and call on for projects on a case-by-case -case basis. I've discovered over the years that I'm a good matchmaker, not romantically, but in terms of putting teams together which turns out to be a good thing as I do a fair amount of project management. Finally, can you think outside the box? I think this is kind of key. Um, I think you need to be able to do this. Certainly most of what I deal with today as a conservator, I didn't learn in school. School was just the beginning of my education. And thank you. And if anyone would like to be, I know Madeline, you will share my uh, email address, but if anyone would like to be in touch, I'd be happy to, to uh, correspond. All right. Now we've already received um, a question in the chat. And then of course we had some pre-submitted ones. So let's get going with All this right. conversation. Now, uh, first I thought it might be helpful to talk about some specific questions that we've received about your work as a conservator, mm -hmm. Sue. Right. And somebody was wondering, um, what has been one of the most challenging conservation projects you've worked on, big or small? And it can certainly be something you've already addressed in your excellent presentation. Yeah, uh, well, Library of Parliament was very big, very many layers. Uh, it was a three to four year project, so definitely that. And the Church of the Holy Trinity was also very challenging. Lots of, lots of clients at the table. Yeah. Yes, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of different stakeholders as well. Yes. And you're trying to make sure that all of your contractors and all of your tradespeople are happy, let alone all of the different stakeholders who have concerns around this. Yeah. Well, in Church of Holy Trinity, it was just us conservators up on the, but we had lots, there were lots of stakeholders who um, had a vested interest in what happened on the, in the project. So it was, in, it was interesting. Yeah, I can imagine. My goodness. <laughs> Now, this other question um, with respect to specific questions about your career is mm -hmm. more timely. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, it wouldn't be, uh, you know, the pandemic if we didn't have a question about the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. So somebody was wondering um, how your work has changed, if at all, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, good question. Um, probably not a lot. I mean, I'm, as a conservator, I'm not, I'm no stranger to PPE. Um, so like everyone else, we, we follow all the, try and follow all the rules, et cetera. I guess the one thing is, uh, certainly now that we're in lockdown, um, certain meetings have been postponed and there's more things happening on Zoom than our face-to-face, -face, which unfortunately face-to-face -face is more effective, but it's what we're dealt. So probably not a whole lot different than other people. Yes, a lot of people who used to be in person are certainly working from home now yep. or their employment situation has changed. And exactly. it's 
would you say as someone who does a lot of, of course, like consulting work and you have your own business now that you've been able to keep up um, this pretty much the same amount of work? Yeah, I mean, some things sort of fell off, fell off the cliff. Other things were postponed, but things that I had no idea might come along came along. So in general, yeah, I'm doing pretty well and I'm quite busy, but I think part of that has to do with, I've been in practice for a while, people know me. So it's clients that I have or people I've worked on teams with call me and say, we've got this project. We have this very three and a half meter tall sculpture. You want to help us? So yeah, I think that's been, uh, that certainly has been helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Those repeat customers and word of mouth. Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Always good. Excellent. Good. Um, a couple of people had some specific questions about um, like very particular concerns and um, I love this one question because when I first sent it to you, you said that you could, you know, speak for hours on it or even write a book on it. <laughs> but if you could give a couple minutes answer, the question is, what can be done with plastics that get sticky over time? I know this is a very niche question, yeah. um, but what, yeah, what happens with plastics as they degrade over time and what can you do to, to help them as they degrade? Okay, yeah, you're right. We, this could be a whole seminar, um, but this is one of those it depends answers, right? It depends on what kind of plastic it is. Um, why is it sticky? Is it sticky or is it greasy? Um, what kind of environment is it in? The reality is the majority of them are not particularly stable. Um, and we know by changing their environment, giving them a lower relative humidity, lower temperature, they last longer, but they don't last forever. So that's about... The person, whoever answered that, asked that question, they can contact me offline because we could go on for a very long time. Absolutely. I, I know in my workplace, um, I work for the city of Kingston's cultural services department and at the Pump House Museum, we currently have a old Ken doll on display mm -hmm. uh, along with an old Barbie doll and they, they smell and they're changing color and they're they look very ill, and I know if I was to touch them, um, they'd also be sticky as well. So that's because, that's well, at least Barbie is polyvinyl chloride, plasticized polyvinyl chloride. And if she's an old enough Barbie, she'll have earrings that are turning green. <laughs> yes, I believe she does. I believe she does. So it's it's not a good look, but it's a great no, conversation. Mm -hmm. But polyvinyl plasticized polyvinyl chloride is really interesting because research has shown that is one of the few plastics that it, it, that um, most of the plastics, the, the, everyone thinks we should vent them, right? That's the standard thing now, but they've discovered that polyvinyl, plastic, polyvinyl chloride, if it's actually in a closed container, sometimes will reabsorb some of its plasticizer, which is a really interesting result. But that's not a recommendation for everybody. I mean, it's figure out what you've got, which is a challenge, and then figure out how you can do the best for it. Yes, exactly. You can't really do much until you know exactly what you have in front of you. Yeah. Which and you may have a very mixed object too. It could have three or four different plastics in it. Just a plastic cocktail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> right. Excellent. Um, another more specific question, um, and I think you touched upon this a little bit in your presentation, but this person was wondering what considerations they should take when they are moving collections. And I mean, this could be any number of objects uh -huh. in non-climate controlled spaces to new modern storage spaces. Maybe what are a couple of key things to keep in mind when that's happening? Okay, again, this is another one of those depends questions, right? It depends what's in your collection, um, what kind of, uh, how is it packaged? Where is it going from and to? I'm assuming it's probably not in an unheated garage. So it probably is getting some kind of climate control. It may not be special climate control, but it's probably getting some. Um, and it depends on the materials. I mean, if you're moving boxes and boxes of paper documents, they're pretty good because they buffer themselves. So it really, really does depend. And if this person would like to contact me off list, we can talk. I know it's very tricky too. There's so many different environmental considerations, let alone the considerations you have when actually moving them, you know, making sure even that you have a clear path, are you driving them? Um, what's happening here? It's snowing yeah. here. 
Exactly. Exactly. What, what is the weather? We, um, at my workplace moved a triple expansion engine that was incredibly heavy. I don't even know the exact weight. And we had to actually wait for the weather to change so that the ground outdoors where we would be taking the engine out of the building was frozen enough that we wouldn't, you know, get stuck once we moved it outside. So it's incredibly complicated. Yeah. I deal with that all the time. Yep. Yes. Now, um, the next topic that kind of emerged from all the different questions was about tools and resources. And uh, somebody wanted to know, I'm sure this is very difficult for you to decide. It's almost like picking your, your favorite pet or your favorite child if you have multiple, but what is your favorite conservation tool? Oh, it's a great question. Um, depends on the task at hand, but I guess I could answer that by saying, what do I absolutely never leave the house without? right? So what's always in my kit? So a scalpel, number 15 blade, that's my favorite. A scalpel, a magnet, very, comes a very handy uh, uh, spatulas, I love spatulas, brushes, um, my camera, never, never leave home without my camera, and a compass. And you may think, why a compass? Well, I'm dealing a lot with monuments that I don't know where north is because I don't live there. And if I'm somewhere that I get cell phone reception, I can use the Compass app on my phone, but I'm off in places without that. So I have a little plastic compass, may not be the best compass in the world, but it lives in my kit. Yeah. So that's my short list. It's a much longer yes. one. <laughs> yes, the grocery list of, of items oh. in your toolbox. Excellent. Now, um, folks were also wondering about different resources, and in particular, when you are a, a smaller institution or institution with quite limited funds, um, what conservation resources and options do you know are available um, with to those who are small, with limited resources, et cetera, um, in addition to the Canadian Conservation Institute or CCI nodes? Yeah, okay, very good question. Thankfully, there's fantastic stuff out there now, and the majority of it is free. The FAIC, which stands for the Foundation of the American Institute for Conservation, has a fabulous uh, a series of webinars, and it's called Connecting to Collections Care, and they've done it now for several years, and they're, they're just fabulous. They're really, really good, and, and you can go on their site and their archives, so you can just pull them up and watch them whenever you want. The Texas Historical Commission Museum Services also has some really good stuff. Um, for a little bit of money, the AASLH, which is the American Association for State and Local History, has some great stuff as well. Small courses like the OMA, so there is good stuff out there. But if you, you know, if you just want to look at what's online, there's some really good stuff. Yeah, we're very fortunate. It's true. The way in which technology has kept up with us and even, you know, superseded us in many different ways, we're you're fortunate that um, the internet provides really yeah. increased access to so many things. Yeah, and uh, the silver lining for the pandemic is that so much more is out there. I mean, I've never watched so many webinars in my life, right? It's very true. You almost need to do a, a webinar cleanse at the end of the week. And I just think so. Provide, yeah, 48 hours without them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mary just very kindly uh, posted in the chat the Connecting to Collections Care website. Yes, thank you so much, Mary. So folks, you can um, see that afterwards. And as well, um, I'm pretty sure Mary mentioned, but just to note that this, of course, session is being recorded and you'll be able to watch it on YouTube after. So if you're scribbling madly, all these wonderful resources that uh, Sue is rhyming off, please don't fret. Um, you'll be able to listen afterwards for that. Okay. All right, what's next? What is next? We're just blazing on through. This is excellent. So um, again, on the topic of resources, um, what would you say you use the most regularly in your work? So whether it be books, websites, points of reference, different organizations, et cetera. Um, good question. Um, it, again, it depends. Depends on the, it depends on the project. Um, I like everybody else use the internet and thankfully a lot of things are archived so I can see documents. I may be in a library, I may be in an archive. Often I'm just talking to my colleagues, right? To find out, you know, and uh, so that's where knowing a lot of people helps a lot and knowing who to talk to. And knowing who to call in that yep. wonderful Rolodex I'm sure that you have. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, 
we just got a question in from, and I apologize if I am not pronouncing your name correctly, but it looks like Elian um, just a minute ago. And they asked something that I believe fits with resources. So I'm going to fire it off now. So this person says that they are working with a new system called Uncopied for inventory of museum artifacts using QR codes and blockchain Aww. to ensure long-term conservation of digital assets. Would you say, Sue, conservators are generally conservatives <laughs> in, the, in the tools that they use, or are they generally looking for new tools and new approaches? I think probably a bit of both. I mean, we, we love our toys, right? Technology has, has you know, I, I just see in my career how things have changed, right? So we do like new technology, but we tend not necessarily to trust everything. There's a lot of bandwagons out there. So it's like you may migrate to an online uh, collections management system, but don't get rid of the paper because the paper will still be there. The electronic stuff may not be. That so. is an excellent point. And it's, it's true that, oh my goodness, I experienced this, you know, 20 minutes ago, what happens when the power goes out or there's some sort of an emergency and internet isn't available. You even said yourself, sometimes you're going to places with no cell service or an internet connection. So it's really good to have the option of both um, just in case. I think museum people are very good at preparing for all different kinds of contingencies. And so to, to have those paper and physical copies available is always a great idea. Well, the other thing is a digital version you have, that's a commitment. It's not just a one-time deal. I mean, you have to be committed to migrating and keeping up on it. They're not inexpensive, some of them. So it's, I think you really need to do, you know, look at it very seriously. And are you committed to, because there's lots of more abundant systems out there that people can't even get into. That's very true. And you never know, yeah, the cost yeah. and the upkeep and mm -hmm. how the technology will change. Yeah, um, I mean, I think QR codes are great. I love them. But, you know, I think take a really long, serious look at it. And is it exactly what you need? And talk to people who've used it, right? Yes. Oh my goodness, absolutely. I had a friend of mine contact me about our collection management system. Mm -hmm. um, we're currently using Proficio and she was interviewing a whole bunch of folks before actually purchasing it because it's true. You got to talk to those on the ground using it uh, to understand all the, the quirks and all the benefits before you actually put your money towards it. Yeah. And ask them about the after purchase support, right? Because people are always willing to sell you something, but are they there when you can't figure out how to do something? It's true, you can be a good salesperson, but can you be a good help on the line when things are going yeah. sideways? Yeah. And do you understand that people not necessarily understanding the system that you is like breathing? Definitely, it's gotta be user-friendly, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, I believe Elion has typed, um, thanks for this nice answer, so wonderful. <laughs> You're welcome. I believe they're happy. Good. Okay. Uh, now we are in kind of the last quarter of our time and okay. I have some general industry questions and, 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 uh, and requests for tips from you uh, okay. as we head into the last portion, which is hard to believe. I did tell you this would fly through and okay. it really does go by. Now, um, this person is asking, uh, do you have any advice for those who have been in the industry, um, conservation industry, working with collections for 10 years or more and are still struggling to find work sometimes? Well, that's a harder one to answer. And maybe that person should just contact me offline and we can discuss because a fresh out of school is one thing, but if you've been out working, family life, whatever, there may be a lot of other things. So if that person wants to contact me directly, I'd be happy to speak with that person. It's very true that it depends on each person and, um, you and are, know, your mobility. You know. Yes, exactly where they're working, um, where they're located. Ontario is a big place. It is. Um, and hey, they may have asked that question from outside of Ontario. I have no idea. Awesome. Yeah. Now, um, this is a person, uh, Shada, who asked this earlier in the conversation. Um, and this kind of jives with the question that I just asked, but is a oh. little bit different. Now she's asking what you might, Sue, suggest to conservators who have fallen out of the field a little bit, um, but are trying to get back in. So she says she's trying to balance a full-time paying job with some volunteer work, I think to yeah. kind of beef up her um, resume and beef up her um, portfolio a bit when it comes to conservation. But she's finding it challenging um, because of course, your place of employment, the hours 
and demands often mm -hmm. conflict with the volunteer yep. agencies. Yeah, um, I, it's hard, it's not easy. Um, I would say, talk to everybody you can, talk to people who are out there working in the field and having a full-time job is a full-time job. So um, it's, it's difficult, but certainly when I came back to Toronto, I, lived, I had not lived here for six years. So I knew who to call across Canada, but I didn't really know what was happening in Toronto and Toronto is a very dynamic place. Uh, one, I, I sent out a million letters and only heard from one person. Um, even though I've ended up working with some of those companies I sent letters to, I got involved in, uh, I was on a board of the Canadian, what was called then the Canadian Association of Professional Heritage Consultants. So actually get involved with people that you may end up working with. And I did. So that turned for me, turned to be really good experience because I now know what it's like to be on a board and many of us end up working for boards. Um, but also the people I met on that board, I became, we, we worked together. So that was a really good experience for me. Absolutely. But just go out and talk to people. You know, people are pretty generous with their time. It's true. And often, I mean, folks like you have such a wealth of experience that they can speak to many different things. And the more people you talk to, um, the more your eyes may be open to different mm -hmm. things and the, the different perspectives you'll be able to encounter. Yeah. And it's all about transferable skills too, right? Just, you know, your, your, your day job may not be conservation, but think about how you could transfer that to conservation or preservation. Yes, very good point. Thank you. All right, I just got another question live. Um, so I'm just gonna make sure that I fit it in. Um, actually, why not ask it right now? Um, this person was wondering, or they're stating first, that it sounds like travel has been a little bit of part of your experience. And would you say it's been crucial to be able to move around and have the ability to travel for work? Yes. Yeah, particularly since I go to objects, they don't come, Lighthouse doesn't come to me. Um, so yeah, if I didn't have a driver's license, I'd kind of be up Kaka Creek. Um, so yeah, um, being able to travel is important. Yeah. Yes, definitely. I happen to like to travel. So, but it's traveling for work is work. So it's not glamorous, believe me. Yeah. Yes, and I think it's a good thing to think about um, just the administrative aspects of what travel could look like. Like, is that included in your fee? Uh, are you able to negotiate that with um, different clients that you're working for? So it's, it is something that is required for so many different objects and locations, because as you say, they don't, they don't come to you. Well, if I'm doing an assessment of a collection, like I did a few years ago in Jordan, I have to fly to Jordan. And that's Jordan in the Middle East, not in Ontario. Um, well, I, when I'm quoting, coming up with a guess, what I call a guesstimate, because um, it is always a guess, I, I include my travel time because I'm not doing anything else. It's like, you know, so that my time is my time. Yeah. Exactly. It's not like you can, you know, really work in a very fulsome way on something else as you're flying to Jordan. You can't no. really up your time that way. No, no. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so this is a great kind of broader question. Mm -hmm. Someone is wondering, what is something that you wish more non-conservators knew? And I'm, hey, I'm not a conservator myself. Um, so this might as well have been asked by me. So in other words, what is a common mistake that a lot of museum professionals make when it comes to conservation? Okay, great question. Um, first of all, I am a conservator. I am not a conservationist. Okay, um, I like trees a lot, uh, but I'm not a conservationist. So I am a conservator. Um, secondly, as a conservator, ethically, I cannot um, value a work. I cannot do an appraisal of a value of the work. I can tell you what its condition is, how much it would cost to repair it, but I cannot give you a value, right? Um, the other thing is, is if you're gonna bring us into a project, do it as early as possible, right? We would rather, be part of the team from the beginning and try and mitigate potential problems rather than have to respond to it. So, and we're not just the person that says no, right? I mean, when, I, when I'm on a multidisciplinary team, I always couch my comments in, in terms of from a conservation standpoint, right? The curator has the curatorials, everybody has their own standpoint, so yeah. But I think I have a great job. I get to touch things, right? Really cool stuff. Yeah, you get to touch the things that other people don't and get to see things that other people don't. Absolutely. 
Um, Donald just asked a great question. Again, a little bit more about general advice for the sector. Um, he's wondering that, of course, you mentioned a working at height certificate and a driver's mm -hmm. license and ability to travel, but are there any other such similar qualifications that you would recommend um, emerging conservators get? Again, it depends on the kind of work you're doing. If I wasn't working at Heights, I wouldn't have my working at Heights certificate. Um, but I honestly, I don't know. I mean, that's where just, you know, keep your eyes open for seminars and courses that interest you and think, well, oh, that may be something I don't know a lot about. So it'll expand your horizons. Yeah. And also you meet some really yeah. nice people. Yeah. Yes, definitely. And I think also it's a, it's a great opportunity to review like what your limitations are as a person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you said that you're not super comfortable with heights, but um, is it like extremely limiting? Are you paralyzed with fear? No. Like is that something no. that you really need to do, right? So if, if someone has an immense fear of something or um, has some sort of limitation that that is something to think about when you go into. Um, yeah, certain... I mean, I don't like heights, but if I feel safe, I'm fine, right? I mean, I work on scaffolding and as long as the scaffolding is good and decent, I'm fine. When I'm up in the bucket, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm tethered to the bucket. So, and the guy that drove us um, was really good. So it's like, if you have a really good driver, it's way better because they, they know that you're maybe not as comfortable as they are, but yeah. Yes. That's and you that's the only way to do it. That's the only way to do the assessment, right? Exactly. And you got to trust the people that you're working with too. Yeah. So it's, it's great mm -hmm. to build that network. Yeah. But for that project, um, the architect who's the lead consultant hired uh, a company to bring in their guy and the and the lift because although the engineer on the team can drive lifts he said it's a, out of his comfort area which is fine I think really we need to figure out what we're good at what we're not good at what we're comfortable and not comfortable exactly especially when other people other people's safety is at stake you have yep. to be able to set those limitations mm -hmm. and uh, abide by them yes yep. now with the last little bit of time that we have um, I wanted to finish off with a bit of a combination of two questions that we received. Um, one in this conversation, actually, as we've been talking, Laura Jacobs submitted it, um, along with one that we received through our Google form. Okay. Um, now, Laura is wondering whether you have any advice for current art conservation students looking for internships in this pandemic. <laughs> um, I know. <laughs> and the, the secondary part of this is essentially, yeah, what advice do you have for those looking for internships and those who are just, you know, starting to graduate from museum studies programs about mm -hmm. to make their start? Yeah. Um, what would you say to them right now? Well, it is hard. Uh, I mean, it's difficult and the internships are so, so important. Um, and I, there are internships out there and seeing postings and some of them are virtual, but some of them are face-to-face -face. Um, and just, uh, when, I mean, I did two internships in my training. The first one, the first summer I went to Dawson City in the Yukon. The second summer I was in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian. And that one was very much on purpose because my husband's American and there was a very good chance we'd end up in the U.S. So uh, I had a fabulous time there, but I also got to meet uh, American colleagues, who, some of whom are still my friends. So, um, you know, you may want to be strategic in that respect. I, I knew I wanted to go to the States just because I wanted to have some American experience. But, and just do, I mean, I also wanted to, to go to the Smithsonian because I wanted to deal with ethnographic collections and they had a fabulous collection. So follow, you know, follow your passion too. Yes, if you're going to be putting all of your um, time and, and frankly, finances towards mm -hmm. funding an education for yourself, um, yeah, don't just kind of go where you think you yeah. should, go where you actually want to go. Yeah. And there are fellowships, right? There are fellowships out there. So school is just the beginning of your education. And if you can, you know, um, if you can take a year out, go, you know, go somewhere for a fellowship, that's great experience. And fellowships get paid. Yes, yes. And there are paid internships out there. There um, are They're becoming more and more, which is great. Yes. And I think that um, it always never hurts to ask too, if there's some sort of stipend, if it is yes. an unpaid internship. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just in general, 
asking. I think, you know, my current workplace, for example, um, in the past has not openly advertised conservation internships, but if we've been approached by uh, a Queen's University student in the art conservation program and said, hey, um, I'm actually wondering if I can come in and shadow your yep. curator and conservator for a week, would that be okay? And that turned into a full-fledged internship a couple of yeah. years ago. So um, don't be afraid to put yourself out there and people are very willing very willing to help often yeah. and, uh, and certainly don't be afraid to ask I mean they may say no but they may say yes right so yeah definitely don't be afraid to ask and you know information interviews those are good things definitely definitely you know just a half hour prepare some questions in advance yeah. it, and it send better. them to the person in advance so they know what you're going to ask you know so people are quite generous so I, that, that's certainly the way I would look at it yes definitely Fantastic. Well, I believe that brings us to the end of our questions. And I know we have about three minutes left on my clock. So I know Mary has some closing things that she would like to say, but um, on behalf of the Going MP committee and myself included, I am so grateful to you, Sue, uh, and the OMA and everybody who has attended today's presentation. This has been such a joy, despite the um, you know, hair raising internet issues I had at the beginning there. Um, thank you all so very much. I'll very quickly put our uh, URL and email in the chat. And if you do want Sue's information afterwards, please feel free to get in touch with me if you missed her email earlier, and I'd be happy to facilitate that. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Over to Mary. Over to Mary. Wonderful. Well, I want to echo um, echo those thanks to, to you, Madeline, and to the group of Emerging Ontario Ontario Emerging Museum Professionals, and of course Susan for uh, for sharing this conversation with us. I think it's always just so wonderful to have these really frank conversations about the realities of uh, of careers in in the field. So um, we have certainly enjoyed this. Uh, this um, series so far and, and hope it'll continue. Um, and, uh, and yes, thank you everybody um, for joining today, for submitting your questions and for being such uh, active participants as well. Um, and so before we go, I can see on the screen right now sort of what's coming up next um, with the OMA. We have a continuing on the theme of conservation. We have a CCI online workshop starting next week that still has some room in it. So an introduction to identification and care of photographic materials. Um, so check out our, the, the calendar on our website to find out more information about that. Um, and I just also wanted to mention that if you missed um, either of the two previous Ask Me Anythings, um, they are on our YouTube page, and I'm just going to pop those into the chat so you can access them um, with Sarah B. Borg and, and Irene Chalmers. So um, another couple of great conversations with some fantastic and fascinating people. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And, uh, and yeah, just to, to give a bit of a plug for the OMA, um, we've been offering our webinars this year free of charge and uh, as a service to the community during some very difficult times. So um, if you're able, there are some ways that you can support the OMA. Um, if you're already a member, please renew your membership <laughs> when you get that notification in your email. Um, if you're not a member, consider becoming one, um, either as an institution or an individual. You can find information about our member categories on our website. And um, or consider making a donation to the OMA through our uh, through our website or our Canada Helps page. So your support and uh, and your participation at events like this is really what makes our sector stronger, um, and we appreciate each and every one of you. So um, our final slide has the OMA's homepage. Um, we have our uh, COVID-19 resources section as well um, that you can check out with all of the various information that we've uploaded over the past year and continue to do so. And of course, um, please do stay in touch with the OMA, with the GoEMP committee. Um, they are a fantastic community to get plugged into. So I would really recommend seeking them out online. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you to our presenters. Thank you to the participants and uh, have a great day. We'll see you soon. Great, thanks. Bye. Bye.